Cool. Thanks uh, so much, Paul, for inviting us. I'm seeing a lot of familiar faces, and thank you so much, Ron and Danu, for presenting. We uh, hold all the Power BI user group meetups here in Portland. I work for CSG Pro. Um, we uh, like to do tips and tricks. We do a lot of training. We just like uh, fostering the community around Power BI, and as more organizations are adopting self-service analytics, and as more organizations are looking to these BI tools, we really want to be that go-to community. We have a great forum and what we call uh, the Pug platform, where people can ask questions, and surprisingly, you'll probably get a response within 10, 15 minutes. People are very active, and you know, I'm very thankful for the type of community we have. So we'd love to invite all you guys to come to our meetups as well. It's usually the fourth Wednesday of every month. We have one coming up on the 28th. So if you guys would like to get in touch with me, I can get you some information. Would love to have you guys at our uh, meetup as well. And hopefully, yeah. We meet at the CSG Pro headquarters, which is right off Barnes Street next to St. Vincent's Hospital. It's it's, yeah, it's just a block south of St. Vincent Hospital yep. in the business complex there. Yep. We have a meetup and we have what I was calling the Pug platform. So this was a uh, platform that Microsoft basically said, we're going to emulate meetup, um, try and make it a little bit more focused on Pug. And we're going to have this dynamic community where people can reach out to the global Power BI community as well as their local community. So if you reach out to me, I can get you all that information. We could possibly also give that information to Paul. Sure. He wants to shoot it out to you guys. And would love to see you. So thank you. All right, thanks. thanks. You know, if, if, if Greg, though this is Greg's first time here, if he seems vaguely familiar, uh, we, we had a presentation about a year ago from his brother Armin, yeah. uh, who works for uh, Wearscape. You remember uh, uh, Armin Petrosin? And uh, uh, Douglas Barrett, whose head would have scraped the ceiling as, as he was presenting. Um, I just wanted to ask one question, just to see if I'm cl in, uh, in, in good company here. How many of you are, are in trouble with your spouses tonight for being in this meeting? OK, yeah, so am I. And there was just no way of backing out of that once I, I came to the realization, as did he, that I'd already committed to be at this meeting rather than take my wife out for Valentine's dinner. So just wanted to know that we're all in this together, folks. OK. Um, was there anything else that we need to cover that I've missed? Yeah. OK, just as you finish up your surveys, pass them to the outside so we don't have to walk in front of the camera. I don't want to take any more of Submit's time, so let's turn the time over to Submit. All right. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, I'm very happy, uh, excited to be here. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Arnie has been talking to me for a few months. Uh, the schedule wasn't working out. And um, I was afraid that nobody will show up. Today is Valentine's Day, so you guys must be in love with SQL. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, I have a hotel to sleep in. <laughs> um, so thank you again. Uh, my name is Sumit Kumar. Uh, I am a uh, program manager, product manager in the uh, machine learning services group, uh, which does a bunch of other things. But I specifically focus on integrating uh, machine learning technologies in SQL Server, um, that being R and Python, mainly pre-trained models and so on. Um, and um, so there is a survey out that you guys are filling. But just to sort of orient myself, uh, how many are, of you are, uh, are familiar at a sort of conceptual level, at least, with machine learning? OK, good. Uh, how many of you have done anything with R or Python? Quite a few. Um, and how many of you are familiar with machine learning services in SQL Server? OK, good. Uh, have you done anything with it? OK, I'll just start. OK, so I'll assume no. Uh, background experience and I'll just uh, and feel free to stop me anytime uh, we'll uh, we'll try to answer the questions as, as I get, uh, go along so what is uh, machine learning services inside of SQL server and why should we care um, the whole concept of sort of uh, the, the, the whole the reason why we are doing this is uh, is to sort of build on this concept of bringing intelligence where the data lives um, so all the AI and intelligent applications of today are basically uh, built on top of data. They are all machine learning, not the old Lisp 
uh, style AI applications. Um, so that means uh, the data scientists and engineers are pulling data from a lot of different sources. They are trying to clean up data, as uh, in the previous uh, presentation uh, said. Um, they're trying to connect the data from different sources in interesting ways, uh, generating new features, uh, experimenting with different kinds of algorithms, coming up with sort of uh, new models and testing it. Um, so all of that means that you are building a lot of infrastructure for moving data around, making sure that the access to that data is controlled, making sure that it is secured uh, with all these uh, GDPR and the requirements. Uh, there's so much extra overhead that you have to, uh, you know, there's so much heavy lifting around just moving data around and, and doing all of that. Uh, so, so the current paradigm uh, is that uh, the applications build the intelligence in them. So you take data out, you do all of that, and then when you have built the model, putting it in production in such a way that it is accessible to the business users, those are all very sort of complicated uh, things. Uh, um, and um, you have to build a lot of software, a lot of infrastructure around it. Um, so what if um, all of that uh, heavy lifting was moved from, uh, because anyway, everything is based on data, everything was moved from the application to data. So you uh, don't have to uh, build the intelligence in the application. You don't have to worry about moving the data. You don't have to worry about uh, controlling access to that data. Uh, because database, like databases like SQL Server have decades of innovations around those things, right? security, access control, performance optimization, all of that. Now, all of that uh, becomes available to the AI and ML applications for free, effectively. And the applications th are then become very lightweight. They're just connecting to the database and getting all the intelligence. Uh, on top of that, uh, the models, or so-called sort of intelligence, uh, becomes an enterprise asset like the data. And it's not limited to a particular application. Right? So that's the overall sort of value proposition. And Microsoft is doing this in all the data platforms, SQL Server being the dominant uh, uh, data, uh, database uh, there. But we are doing it on HD Insight, for example. On all, wherever we have data, we are trying to build uh, uh, machine learning in there. Yeah, the idea is that you, you, you're not sort of um, eliminating the creation of model and uh, training algorithms. That has to be there. Uh, but now, not every application developer has to think about it. Uh, somebody, data scientist, still has to do that. The R or Python code to write the right uh, algorithms and models, that has to be done. Um, yes, so. Okay. All right. Uh, so, uh, KD Nuggets is, is a site which is very popular sort of uh, uh, data, for data science and uh, machine learning. They do periodic surveys. And so they did a survey last year <coughs> about the most popular tools that the data science uh, community uses. And Python and R are the top ones. And R used to be the top one. Python has sort of overtaken in the last couple of years. And the third one is SQL. So with SQL Server Machine Learning Services, we are combining all of them so that you can use Python with SQL, uh, SQL being T-SQL here, uh, R with T-SQL, all of them together. And all of that is available in the database. Right, so that's, that's why we are, uh, we are doing this. Um, so building sort of on top of why, uh, in terms of the business uh, value perspective. right? So in building an AI and ML application, there are lots of different um, personas involved in the, in, the, in the company. There is this data scientist person um, who is building, who is playing with data, uh, cleaning it up, doing all of that, right, and building models. And then um, there are the data engineers who uh, the data scientists uh, partner with to get data and then sort of build the data pipeline and so on. And then there are um, uh, database administrators. Uh, and then there are application developers. So um, how do you make sure that there is easy collaboration between all of these people? This technology helps with that tremendously. Um, and then once you have the models, how do you make sure that it is easily available to the dashboards like the ones that we saw before or the, the business line of business applications? Being able to deploy that model now becomes as simple as embedding uh, some lines of Python and R code into a T-SQL stored procedure. Um, and then how do you do the, all of these things with um, the performance and, and the scale that you need for an enterprise-grade AI application? 
Uh, I'll talk more about that. And then, of course, the utmost important for an enterprise, uh, import, uh, important thing for an enterprise is to do all of this with uh, security and compliance and data governance and all of that, right? Um, so the first uh, one, um, which sort of covers a lot of other things as well, but uh, it will give you a, a good picture. On the left side, your right side, um, is the uh, data scientist persona, where this the, is the key person, uh, uh, he or she is the key person for machine learning. Uh, so their life starts with uh, getting data, combining all of that, um, and training the models, right? So now they are sort of, by doing things inside of SQL Server, uh, they don't have to pull data out, they don't have to be dependent on somebody to give them samples. They can build, uh, train different uh, versions of the models on full scale data or, uh, gets, uh, or samples, whatever they want. Um, and, um, and they can do this in multiple ways. Uh, they can, they don't have to leave their familiar environment uh, like their uh, Python ID or their py notebooks, uh, whatever, they, whatever ID they like. We have provided them um, the constructs using which they can connect to SQL Server remotely and work as if they are working locally on their laptop in an interactive way and the actual ML compute is happening on the SQL Server box and the results are getting back. So this eliminates so much friction. Um, we have uh, heard horror stories from a lot of uh, our customers. I'll talk about one example a little bit later. Uh, but the fact that you can be in your environment data, that's a huge, uh, huge um, uh, removal of the huge barrier there. And once you have the model ready, or the Python scripts or R scripts that you want to uh, put in production, uh, uh, now with SQL Server, ML Services technology, you just embed that in inside of a T-SQL stored procedure, and, and, and it is available for any application to just connect to the, the stored procedure like they have always done, like for any other uh, application, and then they get that uh, insights. They don't even have to be aware that something called a model is running in the background. Um, so you can do both. You can do training as well as, um, so, so SQL Server is a complete end-to-end -end data science platform. Um, you, you could train a model outside and then just put it here, the trained model as a var binary object that can then be called and to do scoring or making predictions. That's one way. But if you want to do training uh, as well, the complete training on the data, because your data happens to be completely here, that can be done as well. Uh, because there is a full-fledged R and Python runtime running in the SQL Server box uh, right next to the data. Um, so we do enable very, um, interesting uh, hybrid type scenarios where for whatever reason your training uh, needs to be done in a different environment, say Hadoop clusters, because you're working on petabyte scale of data. Uh, then you can train the model there and right from there, you can write the model into SQL Server, but your applications cannot connect to Hadoop clusters for regular sort of online uh, scoring type scenario. So the scoring uh, is happening on SQL Server, but the training is happening somewhere else. All of that can be done, but if your data is completely in SQL Server, the training data, and the online uh, data is also coming here, the entire training as well as scoring, everything can be done completely in SQL Server. Any other question? So um, what, uh, there is a co company called Pros. It's an e-commerce um, um, SaaS type company, uh, which helps um, uh, the other like companies like airlines, uh, figure out what is the right uh, pricing strategy so that their uh, revenues and profits are optimized. Uh, for example, uh, you can lower the price down and increase the volume versus increase the volume, uh, increase the price and you know, increase the margin but reduce the volume and so on, right? So what is the right strategy depends on a lot of different things. And one of the um, uh, things that the technique that they uh, um, uh, deploy for that is customer segmentation. This is just one of the problems. Uh, that we worked with them on. So um, I don't know why they say expert target and floor <laughs> customer segments, but somehow they have that uh, terminology. So uh, figuring out what is the, uh, the this segments, uh, grouping the customers uh, based on their ability or in, um, in, in, intent to pay a certain price. So this is a typical sort of 
classification problem, machine learning classification problem. Uh, so they had this similar story of data scientists sitting in a different org, uh, they being dependent on IT team for uh, giving them data, and then the application developers being somewhere else. So they would, uh, let me just sort of walk through this uh, thing here. Uh, so the data comes in the database, and then the analytic server, like you were saying, they had a separate machine, oftentimes they're laptops, and they would get samples of data from here. They were dependent on IT team, and they would give like, um, here, some, take some data. Um, and then they would build the model based on that, and the model quality wouldn't be very good. Um, and then sort of, when they were done with the model, they would throw it out to the application developer team. And the models were written in R, and then the app team literally sort of translated those R models into Java code. Uh, translating those coefficients into, and they thought, hey, I can read this thing and I can understand what that is. And by the end, uh, you know, uh, the thing that was deployed, and put, uh, so they would put that thing and the, for new data that, that would score and the application would get the predictions. But by this time, the model looked very different and the data scientists didn't recognize what this was and the whole thing took like months, literally. And by the time the data had changed, uh, so the predictions weren't uh, good. Uh, so from that world, we, they worked with us in the early preview of 2016. Uh, in the new world, all of their training and scoring, everything was done in database. Uh, and the applications just didn't have to bother about anything. They were no, no longer writing Java code. Uh, they were not having to depend on their IT team to get samples. They were not limited to building um, uh, models on samples of data instead of the entire data set. They, were, they didn't have to invest in this infrastructure. So all of that turnaround time took you know, months, six months, and in the new uh, scenario, they were doing it in a couple of days. And they gained a lot of sort of performance advantages also, I'll talk about that uh, later, because uh, this thing was you know, in their laptops usually. Uh, SQL Server boxes have usually more uh, power than that. And then they were using um, some of Microsoft's proprietary scalable algorithms. That also helped them get a, a lot of performance advantage. So, uh, so, so that, that's sort of one example and how and to end sort of this helps. Um, let me make sure I understand. So you're saying that now we are adding a lot of these capabilities. Um, how, and there is... Um, lot of sort of bad practices around for uh, designing the databases. Uh, with additional so-called intelligence built in, there could be exposure to more danger to the database, right? Uh, excellent question. Uh, this is the sort of the top of the mind concern for any DBA who owns the database, right? Um, so there is a fine sort of um, trade-off uh, to be um, had between, to, to sort of think about uh, we want uh, the latest and the greatest ML techniques to be available uh, to people. At the same time, we want uh, all the security and, and safety to be um, available. So we have built a lot of um, those features. Uh, for example, one of the things is um, the, the R or the Python uh, runtime running in the SQL Server box, they are general purpose runtimes. I mean, you can do any, any, any you can write any code there, right? Um, so, um, and R is especially uh, notorious for uh, being memory hog. Uh, so, so you load the model and they can consume all of that. Right? So, I was going to talk about that in the end, but let me, let's talk about it right now. So, uh, we have built things like uh, resource governance for external resources. So, by default, only 20% of the uh, memory on the box is available to external processes. You can, of course, configure that. Uh, if you are using that box as an analytic server for whatever reason, then you can give it more memory. But by, um, uh, by default, 20%, uh, only 20% is allocated to that. Uh, you can do affinity, CPU affinity, and so on, say only restrict to that particular CPU. Now, all the R and Python processes uh, don't run in the context of the user. They run in the context of... Uh, a look, we create a SQL Server setup creates about 20 local uh, users on the box uh, that are very uh, they have very low access, uh, low privilege user accounts. So, um, so when I log in as Sumit K, uh, it will get mapped to one of the local users. 
and I might, uh, the R job or Python jobs uh, uh, privileges will be limited to that local user. So for example, one R job cannot even talk to the other R job. They cannot talk to, um, you know, outbound uh, network connection is not available. So, so we have built a lot of those things. And by default, these things, even after you do the setup, by default, the execution of external runtime is turned off. So you have to go and specifically configure that again. Uh, and then each user has to be given explicit permission to execute external scripts. So there are a lot of things that we have built around it uh, for DBAs to control. And then yet, um, bad things could happen. So, um, you know, doing the right uh, documentation, right samples, right uh, tutorials, right uh, reference uh, architectures and so on is something that we are working on. Uh, I don't know the great answer to that. I mean, uh, education and, and doing more reference ar architecture for these right patterns for these things are the, probably the answer. Um, I should probably catch up with you afterwards to, uh, from your experience to, <coughs> to see what could be done to, in general, uh, improve that uh, thing out there. Um, okay, so in terms of sort of what it looks like and how do you get it, right? This is a regular database. Um, in the setup, now you will see a feature in the engine, uh, in the engine uh, tree, you will see something called machine learning services. In 2017, uh, this thing was called R services. In SQL Server 2017 release, we've added Python. And so Py R and Python are sort of two uh, children below machine learning services. So you can have both R or Python or just R or Python. Um, in addition to that, there is a separate uh, server product called machine learning server, which is the sort of the underlying technology for this. Uh, you can install using SQL server setup, you can install that as well. I'll talk about that uh, a little bit. Uh, but typically we, uh, this is not in database thing. This is a standalone just machine learning server. If your data is not in SQL server somewhere else, but you want to do parallel and scalable uh, machine learning, you can install this. Uh, uh, so, and what does sort of just to quickly show you an example of what does running uh, Python on R code inside of a T-SQL stored procedure look like? Um, what we have is a special system stored procedure. Uh, I'll show this in uh, code examples uh, called SP execute external script, which basically has a few parameters, a couple of them being language and script. So language you can specify R or Python. And in the script, this, this literal, the red thing is basically Python code. Uh, so when the execution comes to this point, it basically knows to invoke the appropriate runtime and pass this thing to that, and then it has uh, the right connection and da uh, data connection to get the results back and stream the data to it, and so so that's how the communication happens. All right. Say that again. Ah, uh, so uh, good question. So right now we have um, Anaconda. Uh, so Anaconda three five. Uh, in the 2017 release. Uh, but what we do is uh, there's, um, there's a, the separate product that I was talking about, machine learning server product, uh, that revs more frequently. Uh, and there is a way for you to bind your SQL server in database thing with the latest ML server. So if you want, for whatever reason, to get to a later version of Python or R, you install that on the same box, and then you bind it so that your in-database version of R or Python gets upgraded to that. But if you're happy with the version that uh, SQL Server Setup gives, then, then you just stick with that, okay? Uh, so let's, enough talking, let's take a look at some actual live code. Um, so in this demo, um, I'll show you, like we, I, we talked about it, uh, two separate sort of scenarios where you are a data scientist, you are working in ID, and this example happens to be Python example, but uh, it, it's equally true for, uh, I thought I had a different version of this slide. Uh, it, equally true for R as well. So you are sitting here and you are working in SQL Server, getting the results back, uh, the exploration and the training phase. And then in the second part, your uh, Python or R code is deployed in SQL Server, and the dashboard or the application is making a stored procedure call and uh, getting the results back. I say I'll have to sit down. So, 
So, um, the scenario is this. Um, so, I checked in the hotel right now and I said that I am going to stay for one night. Uh, so, they know that this person is going to stay here for a night. They can do the appropriate allocation of resources and plan around it. But when you go into a hospital, they don't know, we don't know how long we are going to stay. Uh, so, it's a little bit challenging uh, for them to uh, plan appropriate uh, resourcing and plan appropriate sort of staffing and so on. So, if we were able to predict based on the medical history of that person and similar sort of uh, uh, data from uh, uh, the cohort and, and, and other things that this person is likely to stay for X number of days, uh, then it can help uh, hospitals ensure a better outcome for patients, uh, better utilization of their resources and so on. Um, so, um, so, for example, uh, imagine I am uh, the manager for one particular uh, line in, in, in the hospital and I want to say um, how many patients are getting uh, discharged six days from now and I see a report saying that, uh, oh, on Saturday there are you know, X number of patients getting uh, discharged, so I better staff of, uh, make sure that I have discharged nurses available on the weekend. Uh, similarly, at the, you know, CMIO level, I can figure out uh, what the resources uh, allocations should be across my hospital systems in different departments and so on. Um, so, it is not about Power BI, you guys learnt a lot about Power BI in the previous presentation, but the idea is that you can make business decisions like this, if you had the right predictions, predictive models running. Um, so, all of this was based because I was able to predict the uh, length of stay. Um, so, now let me show you the, uh, the data scientist part. This is my ID of choice, PyCharm, and I am doing things uh, that data scientists do. Uh, get data, do some cleanup, figure out what values are missing, replacing it with the sort of appropriate uh, not applicable zeros, nulls as, as the case may be. Um, and sort of um, uh, oftentimes you generate new, new features. As in, for example, here in this data, um, we have a number of issues that these patients have and figuring out, let's say, does this person have depression? Zeros means no, one means yes. So, total number of counts is not a, total number of issues that this person has is not a data point that is available in this data, but you can calculate that data that's called new feature creation, right, in the machine learning parallels. Um, there is this thing about sodium levels in absolute numbers. I will change that into sort of standard deviation from the mean and so on, right. Uh, so, those are doing data transformation and uh, feature generation type thing that I uh, do. Yeah, go ahead. Is this transformed data or this is the raw data? This is the raw data. Uh, this is the transformed data, right? So, yes, yes, exactly. Uh, so, I, um, so, I do all of that in sort of uh, feature engineering and the data pre-processing stage. But uh, the interesting thing is, I'm doing everything in my ID and I'm just setting a compute context to SQL Server. So, all of this is not happening locally on my box and it is happening on the entire data set without me having to leave uh, SQL Server. So, now let us take a look at the actual sort of training part is where I want to spend some time. Uh, so, here in this stage step I am uh, training a couple of models. This is the Rx uh, 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 random forest. So, by the way, sorry, go ahead. Yes, yes. Uh, so, let me actually show this thing before. So, this Revo scale pi is one of the packages that uh, Microsoft, uh, it is Microsoft's proprietary package. Um, it has uh, the functions that you will see prefixed with Rx. So, these are the scalable versions of popular algorithms like random forest trees and, and regressions, etc. Um, so, what this allows you to do is work with uh, data sets that are larger than what your memory can hold by chunking data from disk. So, basically you can do an in infinite scale. Um, so, so now here in this tab, I am doing. Um, let me hide this. Uh, I'm doing training a random forest model, and I'm giving it the right, the regular parameters that I do. Uh, but the real interesting thing to note here is, uh, and and so I, I am comparing two different models. I'm doing a, a boosted tree as well, right? And um, so the real interesting thing to do is is notice this, right? So I'm specifying compute context to be SQL. So, 
the actual training is happening on the SQL Server box, and I'm getting the results back. So, so let's say all of that has happened now, and I'm uh, I compared the results of these two different models, and I look at the uh, mean absolute error and root mean squared error, etc., and the uh, random forest one seems to be better, right? So then I decide as a data scientist to operationalize the better model. So at that point, I can just uh, write that model right from here into what happened here? Uh, into SQL Server. So I say write model uh, using this connection connection string. Both I'm writing both models here, for example, uh, and uh, I. I, it just gets uh, written in a SQL Server table as a binary blob of data. Okay, so that's the first part of your know, data scientist workflow. Um, I didn't leave my environment yet. I was able to leverage the full power of uh, uh, SQL Server. Now, on the SQL Server side, uh, so this is the process data after uh, feature engineering. Now, you don't have to use R or Python for data processing and feature generation. If you happen to be a data scientist who is uh, fluent and who loves to work in R and Python, you're allowed and you're able to do that. But T SQL is a powerful uh, language for that. So if you're comfortable using T SQL for data processing, by all means, you should do that. Right? So, uh, so you could do the feature engineering and data processing either way. Now, uh, so this is, let me actually show this. So now, I want to do the train. In that case, I did the training uh, completely inside of uh, uh, my ID. But let's say I want to do the training. I want to uh, run a regular job for training. And I want that to be embedded in a, uh, in, in a T-SQL stored procedure. So this, what you're looking at, is a regular looking stored uh, T-SQL script. But in here, you see this special system stored procedure that I was talking about called SP execute external script and taking these two parameters. And it also takes a bunch of other parameters, um, like an um, input data set, what model name does it uh, uh, need to create uh, after training, um, and so on. Um, and then this red sea of uh, text that you're seeing is all Python code. Um, and in here, you'll see the exact same code that I was showing you in the ID. That's how you operationalize this. Okay, and then the Scoring part. Yes. Again, this is similar, right? This uh, system stored procedure uh, is uh, is executing uh, some Python code, but in this case here, it's the Rx predict, which is the prediction function. Again, it's one of the Microsoft's uh, proprietary uh, APIs. It takes a model, and it takes a data set, and it sort of just does predict makes predictions in that. Uh, so the way those things are being passed to it is through these parameters. The input data goes via this input query. Uh, the output comes to this variable, and you know we're specifying what the model name is and so on. So that's sort of the end-to-end -end thing, and this is all that this dashboard is doing is making a call to that uh, stored procedure. That's how that it was getting all the predictions. Um, so the other bread and butter of um, SQL Server is to make sure that we are doing things really, really fast, right? Uh, so um, in addition to just being enabling you to do R or Python inside of SQL Server and being able to do machine learning on the data that lives there, is integrated with SQL query execution system. So all the advantages that are there in the SQL query execution, parallelization and all of that, you get that for free for this as well. Um, so for example, uh, if you are using in-memory um, uh, technology or the column store indices, now you can combine that with uh, the scalable RX algorithms, and now you can do uh, in-memory analytics on huge data sets. That will be like be measured uh, up to 30x uh, faster than without using in-memory, for example, on the same thing. Right? Um, it, there are features where uh, you can have multiple R or Python executions running in parallel. So you're trying to score uh, multiple rows of data. All of those could be separate queries. Each of those queries are spawning different R or Python process and doing it. Um, the streaming mode, uh, what it does is, let's say you have a massive query, and the query hasn't completed yet, but still you can start passing the results of partial 
uh, query execution results to our uh, Python for training for scoring. Uh, so while the query is still happening, this can uh, continue. I have some examples here uh, that I can talk short uh, about, and there is we have written document. Uh, and then um, uh, the the algorithms themselves that I was talking about, they themselves can uh, parallelize. Uh, but this is limited to the algorithms that Microsoft uh, builds, uh, where it chunks the data from disks, and uh, uh, you're, you're not even sort of asking it to do anything specific, but it, it, it can then work, you can work with uh, data sets that are much larger than what is available in memory. Um, so the idea for uh, this thing is that you can work with anything that is available in the outsource world, uh, open source world. Uh, so if you're happy with that, great. Uh, but if, for whatever reason, you need more scale and performance uh, that is not being met there, then you can use uh, some of our algorithms. So we didn't want to create an alternative world of Microsoft's R and Microsoft's Python. It's it's building on top of that. So we are, um, if you are using, you want to use TensorFlow, for example. We, I have a demo where we do deep learning in SQL Server using TensorFlow. By all means, you can just do um, simple pip install of an external package, and you can get that going in a. SQL Server box. And then we are continuing to build sort of newer features. There's something called native scoring that we've added in 2016, uh, 2017. What this is, is uh, for training, you still need um, the R or Python uh, runtime. But once the model is trained, and if you're using one of Microsoft's algorithms, we understand how to interpret that model. And we have taken the runtime, part of the runtime that is used to score it, and we have embedded that directly into SQL Engine. So now, for if a model was trained using one of those algorithms and it was serialized in a specific way, then we don't even need to call R or Python runtime. So now you can get like milliseconds order of performance. I'll do a quick demo of that. Uh, so that's um, this is important for uh, many request response type scenarios. The demo that I earlier uh, showed you was like, hey, here's the entire set of uh, corpus of data score this thing, which is traditionally called batch scoring. But what if you're doing a, a credit card uh, you know, swipe and you want to say if it's a fraudulent uh, transaction or not? Um, we need that thing like in milliseconds, right? Um, so oftentimes, because of the external runtime being involved, the process of sort of overhead of sort of establishing that, uh, starting that runtime and establishing that connection itself takes a few hundred milliseconds. That's too late for uh, some of the scenarios. So this native uh, scoring scenario helps with those. Very good question. The question is, uh, if I want to install an external Python library like uh, TensorFlow, do I need to do something special? Um, right now, you have to be an admin on the box, uh, or you have to have uh, you know owner access there. And you go to that specific location where Python runtime uh, that is relevant for in-database uh, Python execution. There's a specific location. You go to that location, and then you do pip install. So as long as it is available there, it, I think uh, the thing will work. Ah, you can keep those two things as two separate things, but there is a specific process called binding. So you exclusively tell it that, yes, I want to upgrade to the latest uh, version of Python or ML server, basically. And then it knows how to go and upgrade your in-database version of Python and R, and it'll do that. Um, so I'll quickly pass through these things. I kind of talked about it. Uh, so for um, uh, so for this is the trivial parallelism case where you're not depend two different. For example, training uh, of uh, models is often dependent on sort of um, you cannot train on five rows and the other five rows separately. Uh, you need to train on the whole corpus. So you cannot uh, do it in parallel. But for scoring, where uh, where you're scoring different rows and uh, calling the models uh, for each of those things, um, uh, you can just do use uh, parallel query executions and uh, different uh, uh, queries are invoking parallel uh, the other runtimes parallelly. Um, so you just give this parameter uh, parallel, and then it, it takes care of that. Um, and the streaming is what I just talked about. Um, so uh, let's say you are using um, not Microsoft's algorithm, uh, but some other uh, R uh, function, open source R or Python, and say that again. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, which again will will not be able to work with uh, data that does not fit in memory. 
so then you can chunk the data, say, hey, number of rows, uh, you can limit it to 5,000, and then it starts to sort of spawn uh, out of Python process, and it keeps going in parallel. Real-time scoring and request response versus the sc uh, scoring a batch, it's not that batch mode oh, query. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, we talked about this. Uh, so this is the, the algorithm itself, right? So, so you, you're not doing anything from the SQL side, but the algorithm itself knows how to uh, parallelize and do things. Uh, and then combine, uh, get chunks of data streamed uh, from disk into memory, and then combine the results, and then aggregate it. Um, so native scoring function again. I'll, let me actually do a demo of this. So this one is, there's no red text here. Uh, uh, so you're just using the, this is a new uh, TVF that we have added in 2017. Uh, it just takes a model and it takes data and then it does the scoring for you. There's no R or Python involved. Um, but again, the li it's limited only to Rx models, um, five or six of those. And then you have to, s at the time of training and writing the model, operationalizing the model, you have to be um, aware that you're going to do it this way, and then you have to serialize it uh, using a special function for both R and Python. Um, let me actually show this thing now. So imagine a different variant of that hospital length of stay problem. Uh, so I am a um, triage nurse in an emergency department of the hospital, for example. And I have to do the same things, right? So if I were to know how long this patient is going to stay, then I can that patient in the right ward, make sure that the right kind of doctor is available. Right? But the key thing to show here is, uh, so I look at this particular patient in the queue, and I say, OK, fine, I want to ad admit this patient. And I admit it, and immediately, instantaneously, it went and ran that model and gave me the result here. Right? Uh, so that's, uh, th there could be other more powerful um, scenarios here, but uh, this just shows that how instantly are we getting this thing. Right? Let me do this for another patient. And I do this thing. Again, you'll see immediately it went and it's now new data. It went, pushed the data, got the results back. Um, so the way uh, this thing is going is this, this website is, is just make, not doing anything special in terms of smarts. It is just making a call to the stored procedure. Right? Uh, this JavaScript code, uh, not doing anything great differently. Uh, as, as an application developer, this person didn't even have to be aware that that was happening. Uh, the real magic is happening here in the database, right? So let me run this thing one more time to see how long this thing took. Uh, let me run one more time. Right, so about 20 milliseconds, right? Uh, right, so, so what this is doing is, I was showing that I ran it a few times and I was taking an average. So here again, uh, the, uh, this is the, the stored procedure that I was showing being used in the JavaScript code. Uh, and here is the, uh, the main predict function. It is taking that model, which was uh, written here as a special, random forest in a special uh, 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 serialized uh, form. And then uh, this thing is just making a call to that, loading that model and giving it that data and getting the scores. It's in the order of, yeah, go ahead. This is putting out the number, is finally doing the actually running that model and creating that forecast or prediction. Uh, yes, 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 yes. Let me, let me see if I can show you that thing. But the point here I want to show is there is no, uh, after the training has been done and serialization has been done. Uh, uh, so this, this is where you do the, this is all that way. This is all actually showing the, uh, so here's what I'm doing this. Uh, so serialize, this is the function where I'm doing uh, Rx serialize model, and I'm saying real-time scoring only to true. So when I, just by training the model, so when you train a model in R or Python, they're still R or Python objects. And when I am doing this serialize model, I'm converting it into a special object that's a native code object, and then that gets written uh, in a way that the predict understands. Imagine, imagine there is, um, um, like in any, so uh, new data coming in for that patient. Yeah. And, uh, and then that data, you, you're trying to pass that data and run a model on that data. And you're trying to score it. Okay. All right, so, um, so now, um, 
a few, uh, I talked about machine learning server a couple of times already. The way all of these things are manifest uh, is manifesting inside of uh, uh, machine learning services in database machine learning services is because uh, this machine learning server is integrated natively into SQL server and we have done a lot of other uh, integration and performance features on top of that. Uh, but this thing is also available as a separate uh, standalone server and it runs on C um, Windows boxes, Linux boxes, runs on Hadoop clusters, runs on HD Insight. Uh, there's a version of it running on Teradata, um, uh, although the Python support is, is, is not on Teradata. So what this has is um, support for everything that is out there in the open source world, but on top of that, Microsoft's proprietary uh, distributed R and Python algorithms. So I don't know if you guys know, there used to be a company called uh, Revolution Analytics. So Microsoft acquired that company a couple of years ago. So they had uh, some of these technologies. So we took that and we built on top of that. And uh, we rebranded that product as Microsoft R Server. And, that, uh, and then when we added the Python support, we added, uh, renamed that product into Microsoft Machine Learning Server. Uh, so what we have done, we've just continued to build on top of that. Um, we've, uh, you know, you've, I've talked about this many times that uh, you can just bring in any open source um, uh, library, TensorFlow, etc., uh, and it'll work as is. Um, and Microsoft's own um, algorithms, we are adding new algorithms to it. Uh, so there are um, there's a package called Microsoft M Microsoft ML package, uh, which has algorithms that have been sort of battle tested in Microsoft's products like Bing and Xbox Live, and so on. And uh, so we are creating R and Python bindings, and we are including those. Uh, then on top of that, there are certain things that are, um, certain models that are pre-trained models that can be consumed just as is. For example, you guys were doing a lot of text-related things. So the next order of problem is, how do I extract sentiment from that text? Is it a positive thing? Is it a negative thing? So that's a very common uh, problem in customer support type scenarios, uh, doing sentiment analysis. And uh, typically, people do a complex deep learning type model for those uh, text analysis. Uh, but it turns out that uh, you don't have to build this, it's very reusable. So we have a pre-built model for doing uh, sentiment analysis from English language text and that is included uh, in both this and everything that I'm talking about here uh, is available in SQL Server by extension. Um, there's another uh, model which is uh, uh, for image processing. You uh, take images um, and then you generate features which is sort of, sort of mathematical numbers basically. Uh, so pixel value of this particular pixel is this, and then, then you do a lot of matrix multiplication type operations and tensor uh, algebra type things on that. Uh, um, so to generate features from a particular image to see if it is relevant for a particular classification problem or not. So that's a very complex deep uh, neural net type problem. It takes considerable amount of expertise. I, I don't have any of that, but there are smart data scientists who do that. And then you need a lot of computing power to train that model. Um, but turns out that you can take an existing model and then reuse it by just sort of changing the so-called last layer of that model. Uh, so we have a pre-trained model for uh, image featureization. Uh, of there are multiple versions of it uh, of vari for various complexity and, and sort of compute requirements. So those things are available. Now we are going to continue and build more additional uh, pre-trained models so that people don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, what else? We are doing things, uh, things like um, uh, how do you sort of work on partitions of data in parallel? Um, so, um, so you know, you often have um, many models, small data problem, and they can all sort of fan, uh, the algorithm can fan away and then do s same algorithms on multiple th uh, different partitions of data automatically created based on a key, and then aggregate the results back and so on. Um, Okay, okay, <laughs> okay. So I think I kind of talked about all of this. Uh, Pre-trained image featureizers, real-time scoring, all of that. Microsoft ML library is what I was talking about. Um, I think I covered all of this. Um, so security, uh, last but not the least. Um, uh, you talked about some of this in the beginning, but uh, we want to make sure that this is a powerful capability, but SQL Server is uh, often used in the mission critical, you know, applications uh, that the whole business is dependent on. Um, so we don't 
want um, random code to be uh, running without uh, proper um, like without proper awareness so even after you do the setup you have to do this external uh, script execution you have to enable it um, and then even if something bad happens to the SQL, uh, the R or Python process, it's not going to bring down your uh, SQL because it's running outside. And those are the reason why we did this because uh, R and Open uh, R and Python are sort of GPL code. We cannot include open source code into SQL process. Otherwise, we'll have to make uh, SQL Server free. <laughs> uh, so, um, and then additional permissions are required. Uh, so, make sure that um, uh, you know you cannot. Even after all of that uh, has been installed, you have to have explicit permission for this. Um, and I talked about the limited privilege um, thing in the beginning uh, that um, like each of these processes are, they cannot talk to each other. They're running in extremely low privilege user accounts. Uh, so uh, out, uh, outbound net uh, connections are, uh, are closed. Of course, you can change it if you want. And if you want to do something in your Python or R code that needs to go read something from outside, you can do that. But by default, it's turned off. Um, so where are we going? So now we've done this in um, SQL Server 2016. We added R. 2017, we've added uh, Python support, added uh, new uh, pre-trained models, new algorithms, um, native scoring. Uh, we are now taking the same thing into Azure SQL Database. We are, everybody is going to cloud. You and I were talking about uh, things. In the, uh, so we're going to have, uh, in the short term, in the next few months, uh, we will have our support lined up on Azure SQL Database. We had it live for um, like limited preview for a few months. Uh, but then now we are uh, building it fully fleshed. Soon after that, we'll add Python support in there as well. Uh, in parallel, in the next version of um, SQL on-prem release, uh, you all know that in 2017, we did SQL Server on Linux, but ML services is not supported there right now. And we'll continue to, um, but so, so that will come in the next release. We're actively working on it. Um, additional algorithms and pre-trained models, uh, we'll continue to do that uh, and we'll, uh, support it. Um, ML services was not supported on uh, failover uh, cluster indices right now, uh, instances right now. So we are, in the next version, we are adding that support. And partitioning support was supported at the sort of the Rx algorithm level, but at the SQL query level, it was not supported. So we are adding that feature as well. So in the next version of uh, SQL Server, whenever that comes out, you'll have those things. And native scoring support is now limited to a small set of uh, Revo algorithms. Uh, we are expanding that to uh, more algorithms. It'll never be on all the algorithms because um, we need to understand what's happening in side of that sort of the training part so that we can understand uh, how to interpret it at the scoring time. So it will not, not, we will not be able to do it for pure R based uh, training algorithms. Um, so that's about it in terms of roadmap and I have some resources. If you, uh, our uh, documentation on MSDN uh, could use a lot of improvement, uh, but uh, we're constantly sort of working on it. Um, there are lots of good uh, samples if you just go, um, uh, look at sort of solution uh, templates and tutorials. Uh, you can start from those. Um, we have, uh, this is a good resource where you have uh, SQL related things. There are some uh, ML services related things there. Um, and use this as a resource. Please reach out to me. Uh, we are actively looking uh, for people who are trying this and we are interested in people coming over, doing a week-long lab with us, where we can sit with uh, you know, your uh, team and bring in our data scientists, our engineers, product engineers. So this helps with um, sort of how do we improve, uh, you know, how do we know more issues that people are facing and how we help um, you guys adopt it. So we're um, looking for all kinds of feedback and help. That's all. Thank you so much.